Hey guys, what's going on? Uh, welcome back, really exciting day here. I have finally remodeled uh, the office and studio. Drawn a lot of inspiration from content creators that I like. Um, I really hope you like it because I'm gonna be shooting all of my videos in here right now. I think it's, uh, oh sorry, I think someone's at the door. Uh, like I was saying, this office took a lot of attention. I'm really proud of the results I got here. I think it looks uh, as good as I can. Yeah. Oh, hey man. How's it going? What are you doing here? All right, so fun day. Fun day. Uh, I feel like I've been following your channel for a long time. It's a big inspiration for mine. Um, and we're finally actually getting to sit down. So I came back to Toronto to visit family. Amazing. Here we are. Um, I'm guessing that if you watch this channel, odds are pretty high that you already know who Mark is. But just in case, Maybe Mark, not. who are you? I am a documentary filmmaker from Canada as well. Just on the other side of the very large country that we live in. And yeah, I also talk about filmmaking on my YouTube channel and run a really cool filmmaking academy called Art of Documentary. Yeah, uh, great plug. Art of Documentary is fantastic. I took it as a student, even though I have like 10 years of experience. So uh, well worth it for anyone who's trying to get in. So we're gonna talk today a little bit about uh, basic first steps. Like how, how do you break into this industry? I know a lot of the time this idea of becoming a professional filmmaker can feel like this big nebulous mm. goal, you know, and it can be really hard to figure out where to actually start. So I wanted to go over some actionable steps that people can take if they have very little or even no experience. Um, but first off, I think you and I arrived at very similar places, yeah, but yeah. we started in different, with different starting points. How did you find your way into documentaries? Uh, the real quick story is I, after high school, I loved kind of everything in high school. I was one of those weird people. I, you know, did all the subjects, enjoyed all of them. So I didn't know what to do. So I thought, while well, I'm figuring that out, I'll try to go help people maybe. So I went and did humanitarian work over in Africa. I and when that. I was there uh, during the Sudan war, I, my job was with some doctors as I didn't have any medical training. So my job was just to listen to the people fleeing the war, listen to their stories while they waited to get medical treatment because talking was just helpful for them. And hearing their stories, I was like, these, these stories are incredible. They need to be told. And I kind of came back to Canada with all this rumbling around my head. And it was actually my dad who was like, hey, maybe you want to get into documentary filmmaking. You really seem to like cameras and want to tell stories like this. Wow, that's wild. I mean, I, think, I feel like I've seen most of your videos. Have you ever told that before? Uh, I don't think I have. I, I feel like every podcast I'm on is the first question. Right. But uh, no, I mean, I would hope people would uh, be able to draw some of that from the films I make. They're always from people in different lived experiences than of my own and different cultural, uh, in different cultural contexts and different countries. Uh, but yeah, no, I guess I don't share that much on my, my YouTube channel. I just probably assume people know, but it's good to know that they don't. Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty similar. It sounds like it's similar to me in the sense that maybe neither of us had this clear calling, like I must be a documentary filmmaker. It was more a, you know, for me, I was, I wanted to experience and learn about the world. And then mm -hmm. I realized that one of the best ways to do that was by having the excuse of a camera, yeah. you know, to, there was a reason why I was talking to these people. There was a reason why I was there and the communication was born out of a desire to experience. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't like you, you didn't wake up at six years old and say like, I must be a documentary filmmaker. No, I think I woke up one day and was wearing all black and had a black <laughs> hat with a white logo. And, and I was like, okay, I think I'm a filmmaker. Yeah, no. <laughs> this is my tribe. I, I think the only indications for me that filmmaking might be something I was interested in were, were were that I loved ComTech in school. Like when we did the that's communications technology, it's like our film class. I just did all the work. My friends, my friends showed up, and I would shoot, I would edit it, I would come to school early, and I just, I just, I don't know, I couldn't help myself. But I always thought in high school, I was like, I love this so much. This is so much fun. I was like, it, I felt, it felt wrong that I could do that for a career, which is weird. I felt like my career needed to be like work needed to be work. You needed to feel like oh, I earned it, and I was like, in my mind, I kind of just denied myself of the opportunity to do that as a career because I was like, I enjoy this too much. It probably isn't work. It feels like play. Right. Uh, and then also too, we had this really terrible um, webcam on my computer. It was like the first time we had a camera attached to the computer. It blew my mind. There was a USB cable. I was like, the camera is going into the computer. It's like, it just blew yeah. my mind. And I, uh, it had stop animation. 
So I uh, got all my action figures out and I'd make movies over the weekends and like eight hours would go by and my mom's like, you should probably eat some food. So there was probably some indications earlier on, but I don't know, if you really enjoy filmmaking and you're watching this, it can totally be a career for you. There's no reason it can't. I think actually we had pretty similar experiences and we're almost the same age as well. So it was communications class in high school yep. where I was also the one I haven't thought about that in a while. That's interesting. You're I was always the, the one doing it. Yeah, my very work. first film made in grade 12, Jeff McQuinn, Porn Addict, was a, a fake, document, <laughs> fake documentary about a friend who ruined I, his life. Oh through. my gosh. Oh my gosh. My, <laughs> I can't even say the title of my film is a horror film and now it's like, it's just a terrible title, but it was like a guy jumped out of lockers and like stabbed people and like, yeah. just, I've, I've only made one horror film, it was my first film and I'll never make it again. All right, so Ontario's public education uh, <laughs> Really promotes program. some disturbing yeah, films. Yeah, really, really got us both started. <laughs> yeah. But nuts and bolts wise, you know, how did you actually make it happen? Like, mm. where did you, like, at some point you made something and said, now I'm gonna start trying. Like, yes. what was that? Um, well, yeah, it, well, I, I did go to film school after, after, again, I have to give credit to my dad who really kind of called that career out of my life, um, or called it forth, rather. But I, um, once I graduated film school, I, I, my, my career was up and down. You know, my first job out of film school was actually teaching the Queen of England 3D. I did a demonstration when she came to Canada. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then I worked in 3D, and then 3D kind of died, and then I had this year where I thought, maybe I need to quit filmmaking because I had no work. I can remember showing up to my brother's uh, job. He's an engineer, and I was looking at the receptionist, going, "Oh, like that seems like a great job. She knows when she's going to get paid." Like I was mm -hmm. like, just was had such strong doubt about my career at that point. But what was great about that is I was like, since I was making no money, I kind of wouldn't take any job. And my friend asked me uh, if I wanted to come down to Haiti with him, where he was a humanitarian and film what they were doing. So I, you know, they were gonna pay my way and pay my food. I was like, that sounds great, <laughs> you know, I'll take yeah, right. that. And so I went down there and shot a little mini documentary about it. Um, and it was like, that was kind of a turning point for me is I was very proud of the project I made. And then another aid organization saw that and they called me to come shoot. And then I, you know, was like, okay, you never want to take a sidestep in your career. I don't want to do the same thing. So I got a better camera and I decided to write a script like mm. visual and I shot more uh, interesting sequences and tried to add like a bit of a plot to their video. And so then I, that I put on my reel, my website and just emailed everyone I knew it. And that led to another opportunity. And then, you know, we could spend all day talking about how A led to B to C to right. D. But it really started getting out there and shooting something and, and actually putting it online. You know, one, one really great thing I got out of film school was our one teacher said, you're not a filmmaker until you make a film. And I feel like I was waiting in my career for people to give me that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And in a way it kind of did when my friend asked me to, but he didn't ask me to make a documentary film. He just wanted footage, but mm -hmm. I decided, no, I'm gonna make a film out of this. I mean, I think he said a couple things there. Uh, the one, well, two of them, but I'll, the one I wanna start with is is this idea of, of, of constant improvement. Yeah, you made the thing, but when you went out to make the second one, you didn't just, you yep. looked, you analyzed what you'd done and you actively made it better. Now, what I think is more important is what you said about actually finishing films. Yes. Like filmmakers finish films, and the easiest thing and the most common thing in the world is, a, is to find someone who's got a great idea for a documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even people who've gone out and shot a little bit. Yep. But the difference between that and actually having a finished product, no matter how good it is, how flawed it is, <laughs> is kind of everything. Yep. Do you agree? Like, do you think like, you need to finish these films and share them, right? You do, you do. I mean, that's uh, just to read Yeah, you have to finish films in order to become a filmmaker. And also too, you need to get over that hurdle of, am I an art artist? What do people think of my work? Because if that is what stops you from creating a film, that that will always be present in your career. The doubt of what an audience will mm -hmm. think of your film or the, the self-doubt of if you can complete it. So this doubt is a bit of like a muscle and in, in, in the way that, or rather I think self uh, belief is a muscle and the more you use that, the smaller doubt gets. And so it's been different stages in my career. You know, I made that Haiti film and I was like, okay, I can actually complete a documentary film. But then it wasn't until I made Rescate in 2017 where I was like, oh, I can make a film that completely encapsulates my aesthetic vision. And I was like, yeah, that right. was cool to go. I'd been working in commercials for a while and I was always doing what a client wanted, but to then to go out and shoot my own film in my own style and choose my own music and have no, no one else's 
opinion. I was nervous about that because I was like, maybe I need other people's opinions, which it's good to collaborate. But when I made a film that I would say was with my voice and put that out there and then get the response back from people, that was also like, again, self-belief. It was another stage there. So I think filmmaking is just a series of, of, of little steps like anything. And uh, you know, if they say, if you can ignore the destination and enjoy walking, you'll get further. And so you never will reach, you're never actually gonna get to quote, you've made it. Yeah, never be perfect. You know, because whenever you get to that next stage, you're gonna crave something more. Yeah, it's the like, finish line keeps shifting. Yeah, I just finished my first feature film this year and I thought, you know, you, you would I would have thought 10 years ago that I would just be like, oh, yeah. like, but I'm like, no, I'm hungry for more and now I wanna do it in a different style and I want a deeper challenge with my films and I wanna tell other, so it's like, you, you can't ever expect that you'll be completely satisfied with your career and that's not that the, actual act of making films is unsatisfying it's that if you're you're always going to desire more and that's kind of part of what makes you an artist yeah right? it's hedonistic adaptation you know it's whether or not it's if i can only get this job for this client then suddenly like I, when i first started in photography i've told this story before i for a couple of years i struggled and i all i wanted to do was work for the new york times and i thought if i can just be a new <laughs> yeah, york times yeah, then i'll be happy journalist, then i'll be yeah, happy yeah. got my first assignment it was a disaster i was so stressed out i didn't enjoy it at all and i realized that you know that wasn't the answer to all my all my problems in the same way that i don't know getting an fx9 yep. is not suddenly going to solve the problem and i think it certainly has it <laughs> finished, but f the thing that will move the needle forward is finishing films though right like yes. I, I, you can tell me if you agree but i think having 75% of a finished film is almost the same as having nothing. Absolutely. You know, it's you're, you don't have 75% of it, you do not have anything. You yeah. have a the, concept. It, the own, exactly, you're not a filmmaker till you've exported a film and sent it publicly. That's why for, for Art of Documentary, we're, we're creating a new stipulation to come out of our module one you need to actually post a film online with no password. Mm -hmm. Like it needs to be publicly viewed because that is part of filmmaking. Yeah. It's like an artist can paint all these pictures and if they keep them in their basement, yes, they're an artist, but the art is meant to be enjoyed. Yeah. What you create is meant to be part of the human experience. It's meant to be part of culture. It's meant to influence what people think or, or inspire what they think. So if you never share that, if you never export your timeline and put it out there, you're not contributing to to the the you know the scene, but you're also you're not embracing your calling as a filmmaker. And our calling is to make films. And so part of making a film is hitting export and, and in this case uploading. Back yeah. in the day it was getting it on some celluloid and putting the Share it. Yeah, somehow. share. Put it share it exactly. Yeah. And that and that and maybe if you're like, I don't want to put it online, I'll, but get a bunch of people in the room. Yeah, because if you never it's always going to look either amazing to yourself when you're by yourself or look terrible and, and you just need other people in the room to feel that audience because yeah. it's, it's about having other eyes uh, can consume the film you make. I mean, I think that's, that's amazing advice. I know when I just did the mentorship program thing, a lot of people were nervous about sharing the links to their yeah. projects online. Yeah. And like, you got to yeah, get over but it. But that's where the growth comes, right? Yeah. That's the good stuff. Yeah. It yeah. sucks, and, but you just got to put it out there. You, you got to go make some bad films. Yeah. You, 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 don't, you don't make great films till you've made a bunch of bad films. Yeah. And unfortunately what we do as creatives, especially with social media, is we see just the highlights or we just see these rare people that just their first film was so successful mm -hmm. and was the thing. But usually what you haven't seen is them spending years inside their mind or writing bad scripts or, 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 or working on their computer by themselves. But it's, it's part of the process is actually making a bunch of bad films. And that's why I love, we do this one day doc contest in Art of Documentary and we make it, you have to go shoot it in one day and then you have three weeks to edit it. But we force people to do that because it gets them finishing mm -hmm. a film. And yeah. that act, that muscle of like, like getting in the game and going all four quarters, if it was basketball, you know, like finishing the actual activity, that, that's a muscle you build up, and then the next time you go make a film, it'll be easier. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. I think even if you spend all the time in the world perfecting the one you make now, in a couple of years, you're gonna hate it anyways. So yeah. just, just like get yeah, it over true. with. It's just true. get it over with. Just make the thing yeah. and finish it. So if we've established that, then for a lot of people, especially when you're first starting out, it seems like how do, how do you even go about? starting to make a documentary you mm. see you know cartel land or you know one of these big ambitious projects and you think well how can i possibly yeah. do that and in my opinion one of the mistakes people make is they think too big they think yeah, if i'm not absolutely. if i'm not flying oh to kenya 
then I'm not making a real story. Mm -hmm. we, ha we have a film crew in Kenya right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you do need to go to Kenya. That's the only way to succeed. Yeah, we have a bunch of... You heard it from Mark Bond. Yeah, no, we have some AOD filmmakers there making film for or that we're all working on. But you're right, I think, I think to build, to, to break down what a film is or, uh, or to help people if you're like, oh, what am I trying to make here with a documentary? Because there's four, kind of four steps. Find your topic that you want to do, but I'll say this, topic is not a story. So once you've established your topic, um, you know, like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the example of the film we're doing. We're, we're talking about uh, elite runners. Like, like, let's say you like endurance athletes from, um, you know, rural, uh, rural Africa, so like Ethiopia, Kenya. So that's the topic. That's not a story. It's not at all that we, the topic is not a story. The topic is just a, a general space and place and time. It's a theme, maybe not even a theme. So once you have your topic, then you gotta find your character. Mm -hmm. Who is gonna take us through that topic? Who is gonna emulate what's happening in that cultural context? So once you establish your character, in the case of this, our film, we have Ben Goria. He's um, Michael, uh, who runs AOD with me. They created a foundation years ago and they sponsored his trip over to uh, North America. And now he's the top NCAA runner. This is his first time going back home in nearly a decade. So that's this film is him returning home after becoming cool. the, one of the most successful runners in the world. Anyways, topic, character, then you got to find out their desire. Because desire, without that, if you, if you don't know what the person wants, then you don't actually have a character in your film. Yeah, there's no, it's hard to make a resolution, right? So it's hard to make a resolution. It's hard to have the film go anywhere. Because think about a desire. If I desire food, I'm going to walk to the fridge. Now we can make about a film about me walking to the fridge. Yeah, there is, a, there is an outcome. But, but if I sat here and had no desires, there's no story. Yeah. I'm just sitting here. Still want food. And, yeah, and I could just talk about whatever, but it's not a story. So you have to have a character who wants something. And, and sorry, I'll just jump in. They yeah. don't. They don't have to get what they want. No, 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 no. Exactly. Then you show the journey. Yeah. And then what I always say is at the end. So you have topic, character, desire, journey, and then the last thing is resolution or lack thereof. Yeah. Exactly. So you, I say you celebrate the success or you explore the failure yeah. and both are fascinating. Yeah. Do they or don't they get what they want? Yeah. Either one is a resolution, but without that desire. And obviously maybe if people are going to go in the, there's probably exceptions to this, but the these are vast, principles, you know? vast majority yeah. of compelling documentary stories and really any story in any medium is, is using this structure, right? Absolutely. I think what's what, what I, the biggest mistake I see in a lot of people's films is it's someone sitting there talking about something that's happened. Mm -hmm. We don't get to go on the journey. Yeah. Or if you're gonna have someone talk about a past event, do something that's inspiring on camera that like reenact it mm -hmm. or, or create some beautiful visual sequences that emulate what they're saying. Because then we we need to go on a journey. We need to feel like we traveled somewhere. That's like when I made my film for um, CNN and Discovery, called 58 hours we were retelling an event from 35 years ago so we like you know it was about a girl being trapped in a, a well so like kim who's on my team she like we, she found a pipe in some welding shop and we sent a probe camera down it and we reenacted all this stuff because we didn't want to just shoot journalists talking mm -hmm. about this event yeah. that happened we wanted the audience to feel like they were there reliving it it sounds like I mean it sounds like you're saying there's a lot of ways to portray this journey and you don't have to like limit your creativity oh, but you still part. need the yeah, journey. You'd still need the journey and that's where you as a filmmaker get to decide how you show that journey and there's there's a there's a million different ways you can go about that. Okay, so let's talk about even the logistics of it. You know, I think for me personally one of the best places to start and a lot of advice that I give out regularly is don't try and plan some massive story that you need to drive for 10 hours away or you need yes. to get on a plane. Yes. Especially when you're starting out, you need to pick, you need to think way smaller. You need to pick topics that are Great easily advice. accessible. Great advice. Uh, I think you need to pick topics that are easily reachable by car so you can work on them in your free time. Totally. And if it were me, I would look at friends, family, community. Yeah. Learn how to tell a story about someone who may not be the biggest celebrity in the world but if you can't tell a story about your Aunt Judy, yeah. you also can't tell a story about LeBron James. You LeBron know, you, the, James. the principles are the, <laughs> are the same. So, you know, do you, what do you think? Do you no, I agree. We say this in AOD. Uh, we say, go tell a backyard story. Yeah. What we mean by that is, what is in your town? What is nearby? And, and that actually, often you think if every good painting has a border and then you paint within that, you might find that, oh, telling a story within my town is restricting. No, it actually just gives you parameters. Now you get to make whatever you want within that space, in that place. But I fully agree that's some of the best advice on this 
is if you want to get into documentary filmmaking, not only do you have to finish a film, but go do something accessible. The more hurdles you put in the way, they say this with training for people with gym, people will, I forget what the percentage is, it is but um, anyway, you know, 75% of statistics are made up. So I'll just say 80% of people uh, are more successful um, at their weight loss goals when their gym is within 10 minutes or less. Of, of their of their house like if they don't if they can drive within uh, walk within 10 minutes or drive in like five it's if you put a hurdle if your gym is 30 minutes away mm -hmm. you're less likely to actually achieve your goal and so I would say for your documentary just like Luke was saying it's really great advice is find a local story that has access and then also to I'll add something to that find a character who wants to tell their story a lot of people in our art of documentary course are always like asking us how do they convince someone and I think as soon as I hear that word, convince, it's like, I get nervous. I go, you know, like you need to put the vision of your film in front of them. And if they don't believe in the vision, then I just say, walk away. You know, yeah. you never want to be twisting someone's arm to be a part of your film because then they're never truly going to be themselves. Yeah. And they'll, they'll ghost you when it matters the most. And yeah. It's uh, no, I, that's really great advice because I, often you think you need to find someone, but if they become, people you're filming become collaborators yes. almost. You know, you can't, yeah. you're they're not like the a, They're one like a co-director. Totally, they yeah. have a say in how this story is told. Mm -hmm. They're usually uh, intelligent enough to understand how you're portraying them totally. as well. So you're, you almost make it together. So if you are, you know, putting pressure on someone to be in your doc and they don't want to be in it, Especially if you're starting out, maybe if you've got decades of experience, maybe you can make that work. But I think you are starting off on the wrong foot if you're trying to film with people who don't want to be part of it. Yep. No, I agree. You're again, it's another hurdle, and then you're going to be putting your energy into trying to getting them onto camera when your energy should be putting into telling the best story once they're on camera. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I made a lot of these mistakes as well when I was starting out. Like I would, you know, I was just as guilty of trying to plan these huge projects. Totally. I think if my if I'm not making the biggest most yep. incredible story ever, but then I had all these half finished things that never you're saw not, the light Yeah, you're of not day. ready for it, right? Yeah. It's like, if you want to go run a marathon, you start by running one kilometer, yeah. and then the next day you run two, and then you scale back to 1.5, and yeah. then you run three. You know, you know, you build up to 42 kilometers. It's so, but the problem is filmmakers put this timeline that I need to be this amazing person tomorrow, and it's like, yeah, but you need to, it, it takes steps to get there, and mm -hmm. so that's why I'm saying go make like go make four or five really crappy films this year, because then next year you're gonna make four or five better films, and then you'll make four or five good films, and then or maybe even just one or two. And four or five is a lot actually. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that's then, a, that's yeah it's ambitious. a lot. It's been quite ambitious. Uh, make make one or two, and then eventually you'll get to the great films, and you have to. Once you make a film, you have to take inventory. I say you have to go back, look at it, and actually literally for me, the key point in my career was when I was editing my films and when I would, after I put a film out, I'll go watch it like two or three months later because then I would like, the excitement of it being released would wear off and I can look at it more serious. I had a sticky note on my computer where I would just write down all the mistakes I made when shooting and then all the mistakes I felt or the areas of improvement on my films. And then before every shoot, I would come back to that. And it became, went from a sticky note to like a journal entry into a full like three pages. It's a book now. <laughs> yeah, and now it's a book now called Mark's Failures. No, but it's, uh, I've gone back to that uh, often and now now I don't even read it. Then now it's just in my mind. It's like now I know when I go shoot a, a, a scene, it's like I used to like remember there was a scene in this one film in Haiti, the guy's like sawing like a piece of wood and I just got this macro on that and then got a wide. I never got his face. Mm -hmm. So like to edit that sequence, it was just like a pair of hands and then this really big wide no shot. Context, it's yeah. like, who's the, who's the person yeah. doing this? So it's like you learn these little things and you have to take inventory of them. I think that's Really good thing to do. Have you ever heard of the, the mathematician Richard Feynman? Have you ever heard of this guy? Has he, he been on Lex Friedman before? I think he's dead. Or he, was he, on, he, okay. made the, he was one of the guys who made the atomic bomb. Anyways, I talk about <laughs> him all the time because he had this, he's one of the smartest guys in the world, but he had this, he thought that if you wanted to really understand something, you needed to be able to explain it to a five-year-old. And so one of my favorite exercises oh, when wow. I'm trying to make sense of something is write down, like you're saying, write down how you how you messed up in a way that's so clear and then just defining it is gonna help you not make those mistakes that's, again. I guess I feel like that's really great advice and that's encouraging because I, I feel like when I start, like we just wrote a book about editing and we were doing an editing course, uh, which I don't know when this video is coming out, but it was, it was our editor's intensive. And I was like thinking about the craft of editing and I was like, how do I break this down? And then I thought about it, I was like, oh, editing is just three things. 
Like you can talk all day about editing, but there's just, all editing is doing is adding something to a timeline, removing something from a timeline and rearranging. Mm -hmm. Like literally every act in, in people would be like, well, what about sign design? What about sound design? You're like, well, you're adding, you're adding to it. And they're like, well, what about color correction? I'm like, well, actually most of the time you're taking away, you know, you're adding more contrast, you're crushing the blacks, mm -hmm. you're, you're, or you're adding to the whites. Like you're, you're, you're just adding or subtracting. Then it's like, well, what about if like, you know, I need to, there's, there's something, this person's saying the wrong thing. It's like, well, sometimes you might take the word the and just put it at the beginning of what they're saying. And now they're actually using a real sentence. It's right. like, so I'm now when I'm editing and I'm coming up against a mistake, I think, do I need to add, subtract, or rearrange here? And it's like, I don't know, I feel like I could tell that to a five-year-old. Sim yeah, simplify it down and then make sure you actually understand it. Whether that's, you know, if, you, if you're coming up with an idea for your first project, can you explain what your story is about to a five-year-old? Because if you can't, yeah, you, can. you probably don't have a story. Well, we do, uh, again, I feel like I'm always plugging AOD, but always we do, be plugging. We, they always be plugging, yeah. <laughs> but we always do we do 60 second pitch sessions sometimes on our monthly calls with our community and it's like if you can't explain your idea yeah. in two to three sentences you yeah. don't know your idea you don't you don't know, you don't know the you core don't know it idea you don't know it yourself you're like well i think it's this guy in africa he's, yeah. he's a, it's like no 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 you got to Who's the character? What do they want? And mm -hmm. what are we going to see? Yeah, whenever I do consultation calls, I all, pretty much always say the same thing. Like, if you can't tell me what your story is, like who it's about and what the journey we're going to see is totally. in two sentences, then you don't really understand. You Ideally don't. one. You don't. You yeah. don't. I mean, but that's the beauty is when you simplify an idea, you then never get lost because you can always come back to that simple idea at the core. But then what's so fun is when you have that, like, it's like a compass. You have your true north now. Now you get to build the ship that's yeah, getting yeah, there. Yeah. Now you get to add all the crazy stuff. You can add your music. You can think about transitions and all this. But what I think the mistake a lot of filmmakers do is they get nervous that people won't find their film interesting. So they stress on what it looks like mm -hmm. rather than what it's about. What it's about, yeah. Whereas it, you, you can look at lots of documentaries that have had like, uh, I wouldn't say Tiger King was like a beautiful piece of cinematography, <laughs> no. but it was but interesting. It, but so it was one of the most watched it. documentaries of all yeah. time. Yeah. Um, and it probably was, we're not going to, no, we're not, these kind of filmmakers, you guys are probably not making Tiger King-esque documentaries, <laughs> <Maybe>. but <laughs> you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be so obsessed with the technical and the no. spectacle of it all. No. Like it all comes back down to that one or two sentence idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you were just starting out again now and you had, you know, I mean, you mm. understand cameras. Yeah. What would be your sort of, your sort of roadmap for your first year? First year in filmmaking. Yeah, you, you've got this idea. I want to be documentary filmmaking seems appealing. Maybe they're, you know, thinking about taking AOD or they're just watching. <laughs> yeah, first thing they do, they first should join. First thing you got to do is take AOD or you're doomed. <laughs> yeah, um, you're doomed. No, there's no hope. Um, see my affiliate links in the description. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Help Luke pay his rent. <laughs> yeah, I feel like if it were me just starting out, again, what I would tell and the advice I always give is um, go and shoot three sub five minute films, yeah. so short, very short, everything manageable that you can drive to and that are out people you know and have access to. Do those three things is, and then everything can be built off that. But that for me is the minimum starting point. And based off of those three films, you get your first reel, yeah. you have things to show people, you can try and maybe fail to pitch or succeed, but that's really the building blocks of everything for me. Go shoot three two minute films, mm -hmm finish them and publish them, that's what I'd do first. Yeah, I think if I was just starting off, I would buy a camera. Yeah. I wouldn't be too concerned about that. But that was, I, I didn't own a camera until like two or three years after film school. And I wish I would have bought it earlier. I would probably put money into learning. Like I would hire like a director and I would DP. Like I would, I would, I would get someone around me that knows a bit more, just mm -hmm. like a little bit more. Mentors. But mentor, like I think about like how I just hoped I would stumble across knowledge, but it wasn't until I actually started working as a camera operator on sets with really much better directors yeah. that I began learning so much. How you do it. That's yeah, yeah, that's idea. how you do it. So uh, I think, you know, uh, sometimes just being in the presence of people who, who've done that work, it helps more. But I, I mean, I would just also reiterate what you said was just such great advice is like, go find something let's think I always like making things really quick find something in a five minute drive from you make it 
shoot shoot a five minute documentary and try to have it done within five weeks. Yeah. The five five five. That's how you can take that. The the, the triple five. Is that already a thing? No, I just made that there up. There you go. Um, but yeah, yeah. There you go. The triple five approach is like yeah, five minute drive. I mean, even if it's a 10 minute drive, that's fine. Uh, but don't go past 10 minutes. Don't, go don't, don't you dare. dare. Don't you dare. No, it's true. Like, the, honestly, like the guy who is making your morning coffee probably has a story in there somewhere. Like totally. everybody has. Everybody wants something. Everybody wants everyone, something. Everyone, everyone, and that's what a film is, is exploring someone's wants, their desires. And so you have to find that. Yeah. And if it's not obvious, keep digging. And then if it's still not obvious, they may not know yet in their life. And that might be an interesting story, but that's a longer story. Mm -hmm. You want to find someone who very clear their desires. But I would say, don't just stop. Like if you're going to find that person who wants to finish their first triathlon, that's what they want to do. But then find out why they want to mm -hmm. do it. And that's we're getting, this is like a documentary masterclass right now. By that's the what way. we're going to call this, it. This is probably the longest YouTube video you've ever done, too. This probably is, except for way back at the beginning of my channel when I just let the camera record for 46 minutes while I packed. <laughs> that and has that video done well. Yeah, surprisingly. I know, it would. Well. It's very therapeutic. It's like, I think there's videos that have millions of views and it's just people like cleaning their house. Yeah. No, I think that's on Twitch. Yeah. No, I actually, I, I just one thing, we'll wrap it up here in a sec, but I think you're, I think what you said about owning a camera, I, I will second that. And I know it can be a bit contentious, especially for people who come from the narrative or commercial spaces where they say, never buy, just always rent. Pro, pro cinematographers mm -hmm. just rent the camera on the day. But in documentary, things are a little bit different. Yeah, I think having a camera is so important. Any yeah. camera, and that's not Or having saying. access to a camera is what we say. Yeah, you need something to use and learn on because if you need to go and rent a camera every time, mm -hmm. you're just adding more of those friction points. So totally. you don't need an FX3, you don't need whatever. You you need a camera. A camera, get I mean, just get like, put it, I don't use cases, so I put it on a napkin. Oh, just get your iPhone out, go shoot on an iPhone. It's mild anxiety for me just yeah, looking at just it. Yeah, just no case, yeah. I, uh, There's just scratches all over it. See what I do is people spend like $100 on a case, maybe they don't, maybe, but the, I just like replace the screen every it's, year. It's true and it, you get to appreciate and then I get what to a appreciate, beautiful object Well, I think like, look how beautiful yeah. it is. Like, And then all the cases I buy, I just think are so ugly and they all get dust on them. I mean, I tried to buy one of those today, but they're sold out of the entire city of Toronto. All right, so let's- Sorry, uh, I'm like, I picked up my phone. No, like, I was like, emails. The, the, uh, the cardinal mistake. Yeah, um, never pick up your phone. Always so, be closing. Always be plugging. <laughs> always Pardon. be A B A A B P. A B P. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, okay, so you don't need to buy the most expensive camera. You don't even need to buy, you don't even need to buy an expensive camera. Mm -hmm. I would say whatever one you can comfortably afford, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a kit zoom lens, a cheap, one cheap prime lens maybe? I say I, audio. I, my, my, oh, yeah, I think it's good to get used to a zoom lens in your early days because then you can actually experience every different millimeter between like 18 and 55. You can, you can begin to learn what does a 35 mil look like? What does a 40 mil look like? But if you're gonna have to own just two prime lenses, 24 and 50 on a on full frame are great. If you're if you're on an APC or S35 sensor, then perhaps a, a 35 mil and a 16, or just get a 16 to 35 at that point. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that that's a great focal range. But for me, most of my documentaries, I just spend a lot of time on the 24 mil Sigma um, art series, 1.4. Four, 1.8, and then also my favorite lens, the Helios, which is a 58 mil, which is weird, but it's this old Soviet lens, it's, and yeah, it's uh, it's my favorite. It's lens. got a lot of character. Oh, it does. It's I mean, beautiful. And buy used stuff. Buy buy the yes. old model used. I have been doing this between photography like over 10 years. I've never bought a new camera. Wow. Uh, uh, that's sorry. That's not true. The FX3 was new. But my FX9, my FS7, my FS5, all of my like pro cinema cameras oh, have you. all been used. What I do is this is if you if you run a business, we actually lease to own our cameras because when you lease an item, at least in Canada, you can write it off completely. So all of our cameras, we just pay them off over two years. It's not really much more money, but what's great is we can write off that expense. Uh, on our taxes because it's a lease where if you own it, it becomes a depreciating item and, and your accountant will tell you why that's not as good. Cool. So let's wrap it up. Uh, yeah. Just in summary, it was, you know, get, get, a, get a camera, find some easily accessible stories Absolutely. and actually finish the films. That's Absolutely, exactly. And if you're Mati Hapoya, you make Finnish films because you're, you're from Finland. But if you're outside of the country, Finland, go finish a film. Yeah, you're not a filmmaker to you 
till you finish a film. I can't get that out of my mind now. I just see the word finish. Like uh, I just see like like canned like like the saunas and I see saunas and and like canned uh, um, fish and mountains. Cool man. Well, it was great to connect. Yeah. Uh, what do you got going on right now? What do you want to plug? What do I want to plug? When is this video coming out? Later in January. Later in January. Well, in a month and a half from now, we of course are reopening the doors for Art of Documentary. We, only twice a year do we open the doors for purchase. That's so March. Can, that's March, around the 13th, I believe. So you can get on our wait list at uh, artofdocumentary.com. But uh, I, you know, I think my tornado film would be out by the time this is out. So that was a film I worked on last year, uh, and I can't wait to do the behind the scenes on that on my channel because that was a film where we're like, are we done? Are we not? Like, should we go shoot more? It's like you know, part of the art of uh, part of the documentary experience is 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 getting into the edit and, and making some tough decisions of what you need to add and subtract from your film. Uh, but yeah, really, I mean, my favorite thing that we're doing right now is AOD, because now we're starting to help fund films for AOD filmmakers, people who joined Art of Documentary, where we're getting into funding films, and that's been so rewarding to get to see other people uh, achieve success and, and, and release their films. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for this year ahead. It's gonna be a fun one. Cool, awesome, man, thanks. Get out of my office. Yeah, yeah out of your office, all right, I gotta go. <laughs> it's cool. Bye, Luke. Bye.